Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show with Jason Hartman. You're about to learn a new slant on investing, some exciting techniques, and fresh new approaches to the world's most historically proven asset class that will enable you to create more wealth and freedom than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made multimillionaire who's actually been there and done it. He's a successful investor, lender, developer, and entrepreneur who's owned properties in 11 states, had hundreds of tenants and been involved in thousands of real estate transactions. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to your financial independence day. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome to episode 1658-1658, and today I'm glad you're joining me because I have Mom on the show, and I always get a lot of great feedback when Mom is on, and uh, I flew out to uh, her home on Saturday, a very impromptu trip, and then uh, interviewed her, uh, spent uh, the weekend there, and flew back home on Sunday. And by the way, if you have any interest in uh, flying around on private jets, it is ridiculously expensive most of the time, but there are ways to hack it, and I like to save money. I don't like to spend a ton of money on this stuff, but I I sure do like uh, these privileges once in a while when you can get them. So uh, what we might do if You express interest in it, Empowered Investors, as I can talk about this in our next Empowered Investor Inner Circle meeting and uh, share some of my hacks. I used to do it quite a bit a few years ago, and now I'm I'm trying to hack the system again. So it's uh, it's pretty neat. Uh, You can get really good deals on, um, you know, flying around in 12 to $40 million private jets sometimes, and and that's what I did (laughs) when I flew out to see mom on that impromptu trip. It was really cool. Anyway, I interviewed her. She shared some of her uh, rental tips, uh, what she's doing with her portfolio. And we sort of didn't exactly cover this the way I kind of meant to. The conversation didn't quite go there exactly. But I've talked to you about it before. And that is California's either proposed or already completed new tax legislation. And why is this important again? I know I'm going to get a few people that kind of roll their eyes back. Why is he talking about California? I don't live in California. I don't care about California. I wouldn't invest in California. Well, you're smart. Okay, so congratulations that you don't live there, wouldn't invest there, but you do need to care about it. And the reason is, it is the biggest state in the country. If it were a country, it would be, I think, I don't know, it changes five, fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. So California is significant and it is a disaster area. We know that they're just doing everything to try and ruin the state. Uh, There is a very serious possibility that the governor will be recalled. Let's hope so, because um, he's just ruining it. It's, It's terrible. But some of this stuff is extremely important because California tends to start trends. And when California money moves, there's a lot of money there. And again, this is the typical scenario that happens with countries, societies throughout history, okay? And a friend of mine sent me this. It is from some famous thinker that it's been written about, and I wish I had the chart in front of me, but it's this little kind of a a wheel, Okay, and it shows the progression of societies and California, New York, you know, the U.S. in general and other westernized countries are all following this same, frankly, tragic progression, sadly. And I don't remember it exactly. I wish I had it in front of me so I could explain it better. But essentially, it's this. Everybody starts out in poverty. They struggle. They create wealth. They delay gratification. This is as a as an individual, as a society, as a nation, as a state, as a city, you know, whatever, right? It's just it's just applies to everything. And they start out, they're poor in the beginning, they struggle, they work, they save, they create a good society. That society continues to grow through those good values that they originally had. 
and it prospers. And when it prospers, it gets fat and happy and gluttonous and stupid. Okay? And then they start to grow the bureaucracy, the government becomes intrusive, they got to create a new committee and a new program and a new agency for everything under the sun. And this is basically what happened to the United States in kind of the post-war world. It, it really sort of took off a lot in the late 60s and the 70s. And the size of government just bloomed. It exploded to ridiculous levels. And so we're suffering the hangover of that now. And so it grows and the government gets more intrusive and it becomes a busybody and then it's a disaster and it starts to fall apart. It starts to have financial problems and it essentially becomes insolvent, which nobody could argue that the, the government is not insolvent today, right? But we can do all this great financial engineering with fractional reserve banking and quantitative easing and the Federal Reserve and this and that and the other thing. And so we can paper over it, essentially. But the fact is, the government is broke. Most governments around the world are broke because they've all fallen into this trap of the success trap, maybe. You could call it the success trap. And the trap of success is that you get big, you get complacent. You know, one of my favorite quotes comes from the great military leader, Napoleon. And Napoleon said this, this is good. Are you listening? <laughs> it's an important quote. Here it is. The most dangerous moment comes with victory. The most dangerous moment comes with victory. Now that is true for an individual, a team, a, like a sports team, a society, a company, a city, a state, a country, whatever. The most dangerous moment comes with victory. Why is that true? Because with human nature, when we have victory, we become complacent. We become gluttonous. We forget what got us there. This is the reason not to leave a ton of money to your kids, right? Unless they're all, they've already got their head on straight, right? You know, that's why parents will set up a trust and they will dole out money to their young children slowly if they die an early death, right? They'll dole it out to them slowly and maybe when they're 35, they'll let them have access to all of it. You know, hopefully they've acquired some good values by then and they've, you know, they're not going to screw it up. But if they're 20 and you leave them all the money, they could really mess it up, right? So, uh, so that's what you don't want. So people forget what got them there. Societies forget what got them there. This is certainly true of California, my home state from years ago. Not home anymore. I've, I've been gone for 10 years, but 10 years ago, that was my home for most of my life. What we're talking about with California is important, and it is important for you as real estate investors to really understand the impact of that big state and that big economy that is getting smaller. It's basically California, New York, etc., the United States, other countries, Europe, they're all riding on reputations that really were earned and deserved decades ago. Decades ago. In fact, I would even argue that some countries in Europe are writing on reputations that they earned 100 or 200 years ago. And, you know, like, what have they done lately? Not much. Hey, listen, I'm not bashing Europe too much. I was born there, okay? I, I love Europe. But really, Europe is caught in the past. And many other countries are too. And, and California is caught in the past. Just the past doesn't go as far back for them. The greatness of California, and, you know, even, you you know, New York, maybe a little later, the greatness of New York kind of ended in the 80s. The greatness of California ended in the, well, probably the 60s. Go watch old reruns of shows like Gidget, okay, about California in the 60s, and see how great it was. Watch, uh, you know, old movies and, and see how uncrowded and wonderful California must have been back in the day, right? <laughs> you know, but I'm not being all sentimental about it. I'm just saying this is an important concept to understand that for the individual, the family, the team, the city, the state, the country, society in general, the most dangerous moment comes with victory. And California is long past its prime. And that really, really matters because massive amounts of money 
have been flowing out of that state into other markets. Look, when I got into this business 18 years ago, that's exactly what I thought. I knew that was going to happen. And I thought, I just want a small piece of the, I don't know how much, but maybe the trillions of dollars that are going to flow out of this state. You know, I just knew that was going to happen. And it did happen. I was right. And I just want a small piece of that. And you as a real estate investor, maybe you live in California, maybe you don't. But the way you get your small piece of that is you have these good, solid income properties in these other states and cities that we recommend. That's what you do. And I'm not repositioning the way my mother is, but she still has old California properties that she's finally selling and doing 1031 exchanges on and moving them to really Florida is her favorite market. Now, I like Florida, too. I live in Florida, obviously. She doesn't live in Florida. But we have many other markets besides Florida markets. But Florida's great, as are, you know, many of our other markets as well. You can see them all at jasonhartman.com slash properties. Just understand that with the threat of the Biden administration, I mean, by the way, we never had, you know, after the new administration was installed, <laughs> You notice I use the word installed. After the new administration was installed, we never had a State of the Union speech. Isn't the State of the Union speech always at the end of January? I think it is, right? Never happened. Joe Biden doesn't even do a press conference. I mean, I guess he, his dementia is so bad, he can't even do like a, a press conference or a State of the Union address. Is that what's happening here? It's super scary. But nonetheless, Biden wants to take away the 1031 tax deferred exchange. He wants to take away long-term capital gains taxation, the favorable low taxation rates for long-term capital gains. Governor Gavin Newsom in California is doing all sorts of stuff, all sorts of new taxes that he wants to do, and one that he achieved on, you know, a slight repeal of Proposition 13, which Howard Jarvis got through in 1978, which was just a boon for California. That was huge. Uh, California, I I submit to you that California would have never had the kind of real estate booms it has had if Howard Jarvis hadn't passed Prop 13 in 1978. There's no way. There's no way it would have happened. So a lot of factors here playing out, uh, but I think you'll like this interview with mom. I do need to tell you that the audio quality changes throughout the interview because we started to record outdoors in her backyard. My mom has like this mansion. Frankly, it is a mansion. And um, I mean, I'm not bragging. It really is a mansion. Uh, and um, uh, she has this, you know, this, this big estate. We were in the backyard and then it got kind of hot in the backyard. So we went inside. So you'll hear one audio quality at the beginning and then you'll hear a different kind of audio later when we went inside and we didn't have like the optimum microphone set up for this. So I apologize for that in advance. It's certainly good enough. So, you know, the audio is fine. It works, but it's not studio audio. Okay. So just understand that. And I think you'll enjoy the interview. And if you need us, reach out jasonhartman.com or 1-800-HARTMAN if you're in the U.S. That phone number works. 1-800-HARTMAN toll free in the U.S. Let's just uh, dive into the interview with my mom. And I am here with my mom. She has been on the show many times before, but not for a while. And we're here in her backyard. Wow, some interesting things. Yesterday, we had a good conversation that we should have recorded about California property taxes, Proposition 13, Proposition 19. And we talked about uh, the 1031 tax deferred exchange laws and all of these different things. So we're going to touch on that a little bit. But also, Mom, uh, we went to this great diner this morning. You took me to <laughs> breakfast here and it was it was really great. And this was like a 50s diner. And so the, the menu uh, was on this kind of newspaper and it had some interesting things about inflation. And it, you know, groups the 50s together as just the decade, not a specific year, right? But the average, well, not on all of these, the average income per year was $3,210, but by 1959, it was $5,010. A new house cost $8,450. And in 1950, the average cost of a new car was $1,510. And by 1959, it was $2,200. And this one, everybody can much more easily relate to. What is that, Mom? A gallon of gas 
was 18 cents. Can you believe that? <laughs> 18 cents for a gallon of gas. That's amazing. And I love this 50s trivia. You know, Love Me Tender was a 50s hit for who? Frank Sinatra, Elvis Presley, Jerry Lee Lewis, or Ed Sullivan. I think that's Elvis, right? You were a big Elvis fan. I think it was Elvis. Yeah, I think it was too. Uh, and then, of course, there's the James Dean era. 1954, Roger Bannister broke the record for the first person to run a, four, a mile in under four minutes. And uh, the interesting thing about the Roger Bannister record is that everyone thought for like 2,000 years, since the, I think the beginning of the Olympics, like 2,000 years ago or something like that, that it was physiologically and physically impossible to run a mile in under four minutes. And as soon as Roger Bannister broke that record, a whole bunch of people did it right after that. So it just goes to show you, that's a real lesson for self-imposed limitations, right? It really is interesting. Uh, some of the 50s slang I thought was pretty good. A bash is a party. A big tickle is something really funny. Bread is money, right? Uh, you know, but I like this one. Raz my berries, excite me. <laughs> so let's, let's hope we raz our, our listeners and viewers berries today. <laughs> We're going to raz your berries with some interesting stuff, hopefully. Anyway, mom, yesterday we were talking about, you know, why I'm doing some 1031 tax deferred exchanges right now and uh, selling some of my properties, consolidating my portfolio. But the most exciting part of this at all is after maybe 16, 17 years. <laughs> after 16 or 17 years of me bugging you, right? Tell the listeners what you're finally doing. I am 1031-ing all of my properties, hopefully, into uh, from California into Florida. Now, what... So, you know, these California markets, way too expensive. The rent-to-value ratios don't make any sense. And so I've been bugging you for a long time to get in a better cash flow position and also be more diversified. You know, those California properties, you were buying those way back into the 70s, okay, 70s, 80s. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's sort of the old rules of investing, and they've changed, and, you know, we've had this debate a million times. But one of them that I think is particularly interesting is the one we talked about yesterday. Your tenant who you've talked about on this show before. What do you call him? Toodaloo. <laughs> Only because that's, he said that at the end of a phone message and you thought it was funny, right? Yeah. He has been renting that house from you since 1989. Right. 1989? 1989. He could have bought it yeah. a few times over, actually, price-wise. Right. So 32 years, he would have paid off the mortgage two years ago if he just bought the house. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but he didn't. So that is the longest tenant I know of. My longest tenant was nine years. One tenant that stayed nine years in a property. Uh, your longest tenant is 32 years. And I said, you know, that guy's not ever moving. Do you think the rent's too low? Really, it isn't because uh, most of my properties there are $2,000 and he's 1835 or 1865. So, you know, you always give your long-term tenant a break, especially when he doesn't give you any expenses all year long right so this guy uh he's a truck driver and he fixes up the house for you right right yeah yeah so he's uh he's he's one of these great tenants and i know you have uh kind of half jokingly said on the show before that you like these tenants who are handy right yeah yeah because he can he can put in his own water heater i just go and uh buy it at home depot and he picks it up he doesn't wait even for someone to pick it up he wants a new toilet i say i'll pay for it yeah. You know? yeah, but he installs it. Oh, sure. So you got oh, free sure. labor. And, you know, that's why one of the other reasons I love self-management, I told the story about how one of my tenants in a property uh, here in Alabama, actually, they installed the dishwasher. I just bought him a new dishwasher. That was fabulous. And, and they installed it, you know, so, yeah, it's, it's great. But the interesting thing is we did a little research on this property, and I asked you, what was your original rent in 1989? It was about $800. So $800 a month, and you paid, what, 89000 for the house? Eighty-nine, eighty-five. That is like close that. enough for yeah. government work. So basically, at the beginning, though, you were at about a one percent rent-to-value ratio, an RV ratio of almost one percent. Correct. Correct. Right. And now you're renting it for eighteen hundred and fifty bucks, say, and uh, the value of the property, according to our research yesterday, is three hundred and seventy thousand dollars. Yeah, but it's really worth more than that. Well, that's what every seller thinks, but. <laughs> <laughs> But it, but it is, because it's worth more than the other one. 
Okay. That I'm doing right. right now. Okay? okay. So let's assume you're right. Okay. Let's because see. it's north of the 60 freeway. All right. All right. Whatever. So let's assume that's true. Okay. But here's the thing. This lesson is really good for all of you listening to this because it shows you how rents lag prices. Oh, and, as, and as price appreciation occurs, the rent to value ratio gets out of sync. So this property 32 years ago had basically a 1% rent to value ratio, but now it only has a, well, less than a 0.5% rent to value ratio, right? Yeah. Thoughts? Well, that's very true, but especially because he is a long-term tenant. If he weren't a long-term tenant, the only difference would be I'd be charging him about two thousand yeah. dollars. So, you, okay. so a new tenant, if you had to retenant it, you think you'd get two thousand? So, it, oh, a minimum. Okay. Of so it would be about a 0.5 rent to value ratio. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Great. Great. So you're doing 1031 exchanges, and you're selling some of your expensive properties. And I'm so happy you finally are doing this, okay? Because I've been bugging you to do this for years. But you said something to me that was really interesting when you first told me this on the phone, that you decided to do it. Because you've been buying a bunch of properties in Florida lately. You're really hot on Florida. You've been buying more rental right. properties here. You said, you know, selling, you know, a couple of expensive properties, you can buy like 15 more properties, right? Well, depending on how expensive the property is. Yeah. Because this one that I'm currently selling right now. Um, well, you got three of them you're selling, right? Aren't you doing three of them? No, I'm having one in California, one in um, northern Alabama. Right. Uh, but the California one, I could buy, uh, as long as I'm doing it leverage-wise, right. mortgages, I could buy almost four houses that I could rent possibly from 1900 to 2000 or more a month. So that would be a huge increase in rental income. In cash that. flow. Yeah. Oh, right, yeah. Right. right. Oh, yeah. 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 So it's, it's phenomenal. So folks, look at, you know, real investors are investing for cash flow. Speculators and gamblers, my commandment number five, thou shalt not gamble. They're investing for appreciation or speculating for appreciation. And listen, you can make money speculating. Like I've always said, it, it's, uh, I can spend it as well as the next person, okay? I love appreciation, but we really consider that the icing on the cake, not, yeah. not the main thing, right? No, I just love getting those rental checks. I mean, God. The income is the thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good. Good stuff. Okay. So, and one of the other things uh, that got you motivated to do this is you started, like me, getting really worried about what's going on in California, right? Oh, wow. Talk to us about that. Yeah. It's turning into a situation where you no longer have freedom. You cannot say to the tenant, I want my house back because I'm going to sell it. You, you just can't get rid of the tenant especially if they have COVID. If you increase the rent, one of my tenants, I gave him a $140 a month increase, and he simply decided he would ignore it. Now we successfully evicted him. It took about two months, but he is now gone, and that is one of the houses that I am selling, whereby I will be able to purchase almost four houses, not quite four houses in Florida, via a mortgage. Wow. So you're going, now I've done, and I've, I've talked about it many times on the show because I've done it many times. I call it the two for one, where you sell an appreciated property and you buy two more properties. Yes, but- But with, you're getting a four for one. Yes, but with mortgage money, this inexpensive, why would you just pay cash for those? Right. You should Folks, get mortgages. She's coming around. <laughs> I've been saying this forever. <laughs> yeah, and even though I was saying it when rates were higher and the mortgages were yeah, more expensive, yeah. but it was still yeah. it was still a good deal at that time, yeah. right? Yeah. So California obviously is tenant friendly and landlord unfriendly. We all know that. Same with New York and some other jurisdictions. Any blue state or you know even a city or a municipality that's Democrat controlled is going to be landlord unfriendly. But let's talk about Prop 19 in California. We were talking about that yesterday, and I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah. Well, what happened with Prop 19 and, you know, all of those real estate agents were the ones that were pushing that. And um, shame on the real estate agents. Yeah, but really. We know why, right? So the thing of it is, is that if you are a child and your parent has a lot of properties, once that parent dies those properties are going to be taxed at the highly appreciated rate. But that's the property tax. You're not talking about a step up in basis for a state tax. Now, Joe Biden has made it clear that he wants to do that, okay? Yeah. So that's going to be even worse. 
So uh, you were concerned about the California tax situation, which is admittedly very scary. Everybody should be very concerned about that. You know, California has, I think, four scary major tax things that they've been discussing. One of them passed, which is Prop 19. You know, I remember uh, back uh, from 1978, Howard Jarvis, that great crusader for lower taxes, he got Prop 13 through. And that, that has really helped the California real estate market. And oh, uh, I, I mean, Godson. it would never have appreciated the way it did, I, I think, if Prop 13 hadn't happened way back in the 70s. Well, Jason, I remember an incident a long, long time ago when after I bought my first house, I wanted to buy a second house. And my accountant and everyone discouraged me because they said the property taxes are going up so fast now. And mm-hmm. that was before Howard Jarvis and Prop yeah. 13. I didn't buy that house right. because it was a ridiculous situation. Right, right. And and so that, that buoyed the market a lot. But now, now it's different. So tell us your impression of the Prop 19 situation and what that means for the real estate market there. And by the way, folks, some of you might wonder, although I haven't really heard this, but why we talk about California, okay? Why is it? Why does it matter? Because. Listen, California, <laughs> it, it would be, I think, the sixth largest economy in the world if it were a country. It's got 40 million people almost. It's, it's the most populous state in the U.S. And it also is a state that has historically started trends. Okay? That's the problem. That's, it starts that's, the trends. It starts these trends because these wacko politicians there, they just start these trends and it, it becomes a nationwide thing or it, it contagion to other states. California, New York, very significant. We don't like these markets. We don't want to invest in these markets. But it's really important to understand what's going on there. Why also is because... Money has been and will continue at an increased pace, in my opinion, to flow out of California and New York. It's already been accelerated dramatically by the the pandemic, uh, and uh, I think that's going to accelerate even more. And that means a lot to you as real estate investors. If you own properties in the markets who are benefiting from the flight of capital leaving California, this is huge. This is hugely significant for you. So that's why we're talking about it, just so you understand. So now go ahead. I just wanted to frame that a little bit. Okay, well, it's true that what happens in California, just instead of the older days go westward, everything comes eastward, it seems like, eastward and southward. Mm -hmm. So anyway, from what I understand about the Prop 19, if you are a child and your parents die and they have a lot of property, If you live in that one property that you and your parents lived in together, that tax will not affect you. But all of those rental properties... The property tax will reset to current value. Yeah, and what will happen is perhaps if you've been charging really low rents and then there's a cap on how much you can increase rents in California, you're going to have to sell those properties or get a lot less profit out of each house. So what does that mean to investors? That means a lot of properties being dumped on the market in California abruptly, okay? And that means downward pressure on prices potentially. And and now look, it may be in a market where prices are going up, but the question is compared to what always, right? They would have gone up more had they not had this additional inventory come on the market. So I'm not saying the price will necessarily drop. It might drop. But it depends on the overall market. I'm just saying within the overall market, this is downward pressure on prices. Yeah, if there are a lot of if there are a lot more properties on the market, naturally prices aren't as dear. Yeah. So that concerned you that you would see downward pressure on prices, and that's one of the reasons you're selling the California properties. Oh yeah, all of those huge equities could vanish. Yeah, right. Right. Okay. What other concerns about the California market or the economy? Any anything else? It's just that they can tell you what you can do, and it's getting worse each and every time. And you think, well, pretty soon we will be finished with this moratorium, but then they just simply extend the moratorium. Or maybe they'll find another disease that they control, can control everyone with, you know, who knows? Well, there's there's the next strain of COVID, right? I mean, Bill Gates has been talking about it, how we're going to need a whole bunch more vaccines. And, you know, of course, who's making money off that? Bill Gates. <laughs> the, di- the idea is do not buy properties where the government basically detests landlords. In other words, you have major political risk 
Okay. Yeah. Just like you do in foreign countries. You know, some people ask about international investing and I talk about the political risk being hugely significant in some of these places. I mean, all these investors went and bought properties in Argentina, for example. And now Argentina's having, you know, it has a crisis, a huge, giant crisis. I mean, you think our crises are bad. Theirs are really bad. Every 10 years, Argentina's got a new fiasco, right? And so you want to minimize your political risk like you minimize other risks when investing, right? And California's got this wealth tax on the table. There are just so many things to be very concerned with about that market. Talk to us, Mom, about any of your other tips and tricks for real estate investing. You know, I love self-management. I think it really is the way to go. A lot more people should be doing it than that. But you take it to a whole new crazy level. I think you over self-manage. <laughs> I call her an extreme <laughs> self-manager, okay, because she does like everything. I think you do the hybrid model is the best model where you have a real estate agent, a property manager that's doing a la carte services for you. But you do, you like everything, okay? Jason, I'm just reasonable. I'm just used to common sense. Yeah, okay? okay, all right. If, if they destroy something, they should pay for it. Yeah. If you give them a freshly painted house and one year later they move out, they should bear, if a paint job is supposed to last for five years, they should bear 80% 80 of that cost. Well, 80% if you have to repaint it. Yeah, if I have to repaint it. Because you had, in other words, what she's saying is you had to repaint it four years early, right? Exactly. So that paint job should have been a five-year paint job. That's how you should be able to amortize it over five years. But you had to paint it in one if they moved out and destroyed the paint. Exactly. They they should pay 80% of the cost of the paint job. And paint used to be not expensive. But now, to paint a little rental house, everyone wants to charge you from 1800 to $5,000, which is absolutely ridiculous. Well, 5000 I Oh, yes. I've never yes, seen a $5,000 paint job. Yes, I had bids in um, Northport, Alabama okay. for $5,000 okay. for $1,500. So, foot obviously, house. you did not take that bid. And you always get good deals. I got the, I got the 1851. Yeah. So, that's the next thing I wanted to ask you about. Contractors and bids are just all over the board. It is amazing to me. There's no, how, there's no reason. Th- there's no rhyme or reason. They just massively vary for essentially the same exact job. So you have this unique shopping method. And again, folks, I don't know if you're going to want to spend this much effort on your properties, right? But I just want you to know what's available. And here's what my mom does. You go to the Google. <laughs> it's from the movie, remember? Oh, yeah. You know, I go on, <laughs> go on the line and go to the Google. And then you ask the Google <laughs> for, um, you know, painters, for example, or flooring contractors or roofers or whatever right, you need, right. right? And you get the first three pages of Google and you go from the bottom up, which is really interesting. So tell us about that. Well, yes, because the people who are on the bottom of the page get the least amount of calls. Everyone calls the first guy on the page, okay? And so you simply make 10 phone calls. or Well, maybe you make more than 10 phone calls. Or, or emails. You make, you make, you make yeah. you email. that comes later. Okay. Oh, uh, you make the phone calls to talk with the people. And if they're not there, and a lot of contractors are not there because you have to leave messages, okay? But anyway, get 10 people that you can talk to and you tell them exactly what you want. You have a rental house. It's about 1,500 square feet, and it is such and such an area, and there's a lockbox on the door. Please go give me a price. Give me the estimate as soon as possible. And, and by the way, one thing. I want to say, don't call that an estimate. Call it a quote. Because an estimate okay. means it can vary. I want a quote on the job. I oh, don't want them to well, wiggle on me later. But oh, yeah, oh absolutely. Yeah. And so you simply, you know, Hire the best price. Sometimes the absolute cheapest price isn't exactly the best. But you know what? You have to be experienced enough by this time to know who is a real painter and who paints as a sideline. And you don't want the guy who paints as a sideline. You want him in there and out in two to four days. So it's just simple. And your prices will vary from what just happened to me from $1,850 to $5,000. So obviously, you know, anybody can paint pretty decently. Right. So in this case, I probably just choose the cheapest one. Okay. So, but you, you go and you look at the first three, what they call it SERPs, search engine results pages on Google. Okay. And you go to the third page, you print them and you go to the third page and, and start then, your phone and you start bottom up. 
Yeah. Okay. Because that's the guy who has not figured out how to optimize his SEO and he doesn't yeah. have a lot of calls, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And so right. that's right. the guy who's going to be more hungry for business yeah. and more reasonable. That's and right. also the person in your conversation with them, you know, he has to be available to go to work almost immediately, okay? Right. He can't have jobs going out for six months right. and Time is I might get to you. Yeah. You okay? got to get it done right away. Th those are the only two things about any of this, okay? Okay. What other tips and tricks? What about like, uh, you know, your sister, Aunt Joan, who's been on the podcast and also spoken at a couple of my conferences with you on the stage. She has these house rules. You know, what are you putting anything interesting into your leases uh, lately or any lessons you've learned about the clauses and the contracts and things like that? Well, in Florida, because, you know, I don't know the rule, all the rules of that state, I use that big, huge lease that everyone uses in Florida, but it really doesn't protect the owner very much. But I always do add my one page mm -hmm. about painting lasting for five years. If they don't change the filters and those filters are filthy, it can break down the whole system. That's for the a a HVAC filters. You know, I'm going to charge you $100 if I walk in there and that thing is embedded with dirt. And, you know, a real true example, Jason, I just paid $7,500 about a year ago to install a brand new furnace in a house of mine in Santa Ana. Mm -hmm. The tenant called and he said... Is that an that air conditioner too? Uh, no, just the heater. Just That's the expensive. Heater. Yeah. Well, well, California oh, prices, oh, oh, right? Oh, this house was built in 1935, yeah. so it had asbestos yeah. tubes. Well, I used to live in that house as a kid. Well, yeah, 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 I know the house. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So we had to be a little careful about the, uh, you know, asbestos, asbestos. tube okay. removal. Otherwise, it wouldn't have cost that much. And, and just so everybody knows, asbestos, I believe it was 1978, was the last year you could use asbestos in building materials. And if it's in the house, you can leave it there. Just don't disturb it. That's the whole thing. It's okay to stay. You don't have to remove it, but... Uh, yeah, but I yeah. had to do all those new ducts for the furnace, okay, so that's it. why it had to be removed. So that's why it was expensive. Yeah. But. So anyway, the tenant calls up and said that this brand new furnace, the air isn't coming out. And I said, well, <laughs> that can't be happening. So he called up the company that installed it, and the company came out and they examined it. He had not changed that filter within a year. And this oh. guy is in construction, if you can believe that. That filter was so filthy, and the company said, Joyce, your system almost was broken because of that. Wow. So okay. anyway, the filter was changed, and he had to pay for the service call. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now that's actually a, a good point that you bring up, Mom. You are good at, and I think I'm pretty good at it too, when we mentioned this earlier when we started today, delegating a lot of the work to the tenants. Isn't it amazing when you self-manage, you find that the tenant will very willingly and happily do a lot of the work for you. I yeah. mean, they, they, they some literally, will, yeah. some will, not all of them. They all call around, they'll find contractors, they'll get quotes, they'll get the best price. They, I mean, they really, it's great when you get the tenant who's in alignment with you. Yeah. And they're really helping you and they act like an owner. They take ownership. Any thoughts or tips on that? Well, the longer the tenant lives there, the less he will call you because he will begin to just fix things himself. Maybe he, he or she. You, he, better, he, you better be politically correct here. Oh, I forget that. <laughs> <laughs> she has tenants of both genders, okay? Uh, anyway, the thing of it is, the longer they live there, the more they consider it their home. But it can go the opposite way. The longer they live there, they may never fix anything, okay? Uh -huh. So, you know, there's kind of two sides to that. But actually, usually, the longer they live there, the less phone calls you'll ever get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, so tenant turnover. That's expensive. And we want to minimize tenant turnover. But at the same time, we want to raise our rents and optimize our rents. Any thoughts or tips you, you can share there? Well, you simply must raise the rent every year. And I don't go out and renew the leases every year. I simply send them this form that I got from the um, Apartment, Apartment Owners, Owners Association. Yeah. Your rent increase for this next year is such and such. And it's not that they have to sign it either. It begins within 30 days or two months or depending on how long they've lived there. And you know what? They just pay it. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so you no do... No arguments. Right, and by the way, I just want to mention for those who don't know, you only own single-family homes. You don't own any apartments. But you, oh, you, never. You, you just use a lot of the stuff from the Apartment Owners Association. The oh, forms correct, and so forth. correct. Yeah, yeah. Now, just out of curiosity, and you told me this so long ago, I remember you telling me this probably maybe before I ever owned, I think before I ever owned a property, and I was 20 when I bought my first rental property, but you told me you didn't like apartments way back then. And I remember what you said. I, you probably don't remember this. Well, I, that, but I rem yeah. if, why, why don't you like apartments? Though? Just, because no. they gang up on you and they talk to each other. And if you give a rent increase to one, if she's chatty with her neighbor, uh, you know, next door, she's going to go and ask, did you get a rent increase? Or what did he do? I mean, when you own single family homes, each tenant is isolated. Right. No one knows where anyone else lives. And you as the landlord should never tell that to anyone. Right. You're on an equal basis. Actually, you as the landlord have much more power than the tenant in most states, except okay. California, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. So or in um, New York, obviously, but yeah, they get the idea. Yeah. But, but the idea is that you won't have tenants comparing what has happened to one and believe me it'll be used against the landlord right so in other words rent strikes that's what you told me when I was oh yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Right, right. you know the the when you have an apartment and listen i've owned a couple of big apartment complexes one was 125 units another one was 139 units that i owned with one of our clients steve and many of you have met him at our conferences I made money on those, okay? They were great. I, I loved it. I've got a mobile home park I own with him now. He's a client of ours, been a great client for many, many years, maybe 11 years now, I think. And he started buying single family homes. And so we went in on three deals together, okay? And, you know, I made money on those. But the thing people need to understand is that apartments take a ton of attention. They are like running a business. Just like a business, just like a, the restaurant down the street, you're gonna have Yelp reviews, and they are going to say bad things about you. They are going to gang up on you. They're going to conspire against you. They're going to have mutinies. There's going to be, there could be rent strikes. They'll make a Facebook group that's a private group where all the tenants are in there chatting about you. Oh. And, oh, and, you know, they can do a telegram group and they can do whatever, you know, a text chat, an email thread, and all these things. And, you know, look at most of our investors, they don't want to work that hard, right? You can make money doing it. I know, you, you know, you can make money in any part of real estate. There's always money to be made. But I just agree with you completely. I, li I love the single family homes. They're, they're just the best. They appreciate the best. You get the best quality tenants in them. Any other tips or things you want to share uh, just um, on, on anything? The only thing is that right now, what I'm concerned about is that nobody wants to move. So you can't get your house back yeah. to sell it. Right. Yeah. To 1031 it. Yeah. I don't want to have to, you know, evict all of these people because it costs too much money. So I hope that the market just loosens up so people have a place to go. Yeah. And they yeah. won't be afraid, you know. Right, to right. Move. No, this this market is very hard to operate in for a referral network like us because the houses are just they're just gone in a second. Yeah. And it, it's just it's really hard. I like a more even keel market where there's a, a balanced amount of supply and demand, but right now it's just way crazy to the demand side. Supply is very, very short, but that's why prices are going up and rents are going up. So, you know, there, there are benefits obviously, but, but there are hardships too. But let's just wrap up and let's talk about the uh, terrifying Biden administration for a moment, okay? If you could see her roll her eyes, <laughs> just that. <laughs> So, so Biden has made it clear that he wants to do away with the 1031 tax deferred exchange. He wants to do away with long-term capital gains tax. And he wants to do away with a step up in basis for your heirs for property values when parents pass away, right? So uh, this is hugely significant. And all of these things have a lot to do with real estate, but they also have to do with family businesses that want to be passed down through the generations all kinds of really, really scary stuff. So think about this, folks. This is why I am doing 1031 exchanges right now. It's why my mom is doing them right now. And this is a really good time to reposition your portfolio and get it the way you want, the way people are repositioning where they live, you know, moving from the cities to the suburbs. It's the same idea. If that 1031 tax deferred exchange goes away, uh, as Biden has made very clear he wants to take it away, that will be just a huge impact on real estate investors. There are many angles to it. 
if the estate tax changes to where there's no step up in basis, it's going to force a whole bunch of people to sell properties. Oh, the long-term capital gains tax, yeah, right? Yeah. So if that goes away and people sell a property, they're going to be taxed as ordinary income, not long-term capital gains. So not only it's like this double whammy, not only no 1031, but no long-term capital gains. Or just taxing the wealth of yeah. people. Right. I mean, properties after a while make you rather wealthy. I mean, can you imagine them taxing that? Yeah. By who say so? Would they know the value of that house? Well, they some government jerk that would go out there and say, "Oh, this house is worth such and such." There will be litigation. There will be appraisals and litigation, and you know, people will have to sue the IRS, and you know, it'll it'll be a total mess. Okay, just a complete mess. But the idea is to disallow people from passing on wealth. Biden thinks. That is wrong. He has made it very clear that you shouldn't be able to do that. And, you know, this is a wealth redistribution. It's Marxism. Okay, that's basically what it is. So we'll see if it happens. But uh, look, under the fear that it might happen, I am doing stuff now. My mom is doing stuff now. And many of our clients are doing stuff now for this exact reason. So if you want to reposition your portfolio, talk to your investment counselor. Uh, you know, this is all free consultation. They can help you talking about these subjects. So good stuff. Anything else? Wrap it up. Happy investing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. Happy investing. And uh, we'll talk to you on the next episode. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, HartmanMedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.